Father, thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for your great love, your mercy, and Lord, as, uh, as the building's coming along, we thank you, Lord, seeing the decking getting put in place, uh, the concrete soon to be here. Uh, not a minute too soon, Lord, as it's uh, tight in the back there with the little guys. Thank you for how you have provided, Lord. You are so faithful. Now, Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you would continue to open our hearts and do the work in us that you have been desiring to do. Lord, as we have been so blessed by looking into the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and also Joseph, just to see the great power of God and to see your faithfulness, I pray, Lord, that you would take now these chapters, open them to our hearts afresh, and that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just powerfully pour through your word, minister to your people, and please encourage them today in their walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pick it up in chapter 44, verse 17. And Joseph said, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. And then Judah came near unto Joseph and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant. For thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, he would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall not see my face, or you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Well, go again, and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if you take this also from me, mischief shall befall him, or mischief shall befall him. You shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And now, therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became a surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go. Let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father? And then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And so his servants would leave. And there stood no man with him. And Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, and he wept aloud. So much so that the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. That had to be pretty loud if you think about it. He just starts sobbing. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. I'm sure they struggled to take it in. I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled, literally, to be overwhelmed like an army facing disaster. They were terrified at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. Pieces. And I he saw, said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And that would shock whom? Benjamin. Benjamin would be going, What? Huh? You sold him? Apparently, this got pretty heated because verse 5, God is. Therefore, 
Be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. For God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity, or the idea is a remnant, in the earth, and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God, literally, you know, of our family. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And once again, Joseph is a man who has enough insight into the things of God that he understands that even though what they intended for wickedness against him, God used. And so even though the circumstances weren't the best, where he's falsely accused of attempting to rape Potiphar's wife and he's sold as a slave and dragged down by the Midianites, even though he's been through great hardship, yet in spite of that, he realizes he can see the hand of God working behind those things. God used them, yes? Does that mean God caused them? You know, sadly, some people go through great pain in their lives. Horrible things are allowed to be done to them. And unfortunately for some of them, they harden their hearts against God and they say things like, if that's what a God of love is all about, who let these things happen to me, or often they'll say, did these things to me, how could I ever follow them? Well, does God do anything evil? Answer, no. no. Could he stop it? There's a day coming when evil is going to be shut down on this earth when the Lord returns, yes? Yes. But for some reason, God allows some things. If the pain in your life is what has brought you to sit here and open your heart to Jesus and get into the word of God and receive eternal life, while I'm sorry for that pain in your life, God has used it to give you eternal life, to bring you to the end of yourself that you might look up. I do have to say there are some questions I have for God when I get to heaven. I'm sure you may have a few too. Why? Why? Did, why this pain? Why this, you know, and, but I have a feeling when I see him, I'll also say, you know, no further question. I, I'm just, you know, I'm just so happy to be on the sea of glass. These four living creatures are really amazing. I, I, I'm just happy to be here. It was not you that sent me here, but God, verse 8. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph. What's the first thing he once said to his father? What is it? Look. First thing Joseph wants to talk to his father about is not what he's achieved, but about who God is. God hath made me lord of all Egypt. God has been in this. 22 years, first subject mentioned to his dad, God. God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, which means to draw near, best we can tell. And thou shalt be near unto me, thou, and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish you. For there are yet five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Question. How do we know Joseph's really forgiven them? Well, he didn't have their heads cut off. That's a good sign, right? Everybody with me? He hasn't chained them up and thrown them in the jail to rot. Simeon spent a little while there, but... Not only does he not hold against them the wrongs that have been done to him by them, but notice these two verses here, verse 9, verse 10. Go tell my father to come down, bring your families, and I will take care of you. I will nourish you. This man has such forgiveness towards his brothers, towards his family, that not only is he not bitter against them, but he's going to spend the next five years seeing, seeking their well-being and providing for them. I mean, if that's not an obvious example of real forgiveness, where real forgiveness not only has moved on past the wrongs that have been done, but now begins to go forward in the right and positive direction to bless those who had hurt you. That's really letting it go, so to speak. 
to where he's beyond the pain and the hurt. He can see the hand of God. He understands it. While they meant something for evil, God used it for good. And since God has allowed this thing, then I should embrace it and go forward and serve him. What an amazing man this Joseph is. And he's got a whole lot less Bible than you or I have. Know what I mean? Go. Tell my father what God has done. Bring your families. I'll nourish you for five years so you don't come to poverty. What did the Lord say to Peter and to the disciples when he was risen from the dead? Don't be afraid. It's me. Touch my hands. Come here, Thomas. Come on. No, come on. There you go. It's me. You're my friends. And so, verse 12, Behold, your eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and you shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed, what is it? All his brethren, and wept upon them each of them. What a beautiful thing forgiveness is. See how they can move forward? How many remember Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7, who was one of the first martyrs in the church? Stephen the martyr. How many remember him? Remember he was there and he was strongly used by the Holy Spirit to, to, to argue with the Hellenistic Jews and they finally made false charges against him. He spoke against Moses and the temple and the things of God and the people and the leadership and all that. So they dragged him in front of the Sanhedrin. And Stephen began his defense, and he gives a very long chapter there where he reviews the history of Israel for the Sanhedrin, who are supposed to know exactly about the history of Israel. So he's basically reviewing for them what's their special. And he begins to give them a pattern. God sends Joseph. First time, his brothers reject him, sell him as a slave. Second time, they receive him here in his glory, when he's now second ruler of Egypt. God sends to Israel Moses. First time when the Jews are fighting among themselves, you know, Moses tries to break it up, and he says, what, are you going to kill me like that Egyptian you killed yesterday? I mean, who are you? And Moses has to flee. First time, they reject him. Second time, he comes back 40 years later. Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Which, by the way, is our next book that we're getting into because it follows the page after this book. <laughs> First time, they rejected their deliverer. Second time, they accepted them. And then Stephen lays into the leadership of Israel and says, you stiff-necked, you heart of heart, Hello, do you see the pattern? God just sent you King Messiah. Guess what? First time, what happened? They rejected him. But God knew this would happen. Does that mean he caused it? Boy, here we go again, right? But God would allow their hard-heartedness and rejection of his own son so that his son could lay down his life for both Jew and Gentile, die on a cross, rise again on the third day, so that whosoever believes upon him would not perish but receive everlasting life. God used it. But that's why Jesus said to him in Matthew 23 when he lays into the leadership and he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and as he will return to the Mount of Olives. And so all Israel will be saved and delivered. First time they rejected him, but the second time they're going to accept him. But back to our text. He fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck. He wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren. He wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him, 20 years to catch up here. And the fame thereof <clears throat> was heard in Potiphar's house, saying, Hey, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, lay your beasts and go, and get you into the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt." and you shall eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, this do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. I would say they have an invitation. Anybody else buy that too? What do you think? Who's inviting them? Pharaoh, who's he? Guy of the whole, you know, he's the king, right? So they're now his guests. Everybody's still with me. In that culture, when you are an invited guest to someone's home or tent or wherever the case may be, you come under their protection. 
Remember there when the angels came to Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah? It didn't go so well, but I don't agree with Lot's strategy. But he tried to protect them. Why? Because in what's called that oriental culture, a guest, an invited guest, is now under your protection. Even if he were to be your enemy and he shows up socially, you're called to protect even your enemy under your roof because of that culture. And I know what you're thinking. Why are you telling us this? Because the next book is going to be the book of Exodus. And eventually there will be a Pharaoh who knows not Joseph and he will begin to be concerned about the Jews then we'll begin to enslave the Jews and then begin to systematically wipe out their male children of the Jews. They were invited guests. If you understand culturally what's going on here, it is all the more horrific the crimes against Israel done by the Egyptians because they were guests. So put that in the back of your head for the next book. You're going to need that. You're commanded. Bring your kids. Get on the wagons. Come on down. Don't, verse 20, regard not your stuff. For the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. We'll take care of you. Does this Pharaoh owe Joseph a little something? How about his whole kingdom? Wait till you see the whole financial side of this. We still have a few chapters to go here. Pharaoh is going to end up on top of everything by the end of this famine. Bring your, just come on, don't even bring your stuff. Just come on down, stay with us. So verse 21. And the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons, according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the way. And to all of them he gave each man changes, plural, of raiment, which are very expensive, time-consuming, gave them clothing. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. And to his father he sent after this manner. Remember Jacob sent him a gift? Now it's his turn. Ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, ten she-asses laden with grain or corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. And so he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And Joseph said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. What does that mean? Make sure you guys don't get into a fight on the way home. Now why would he have to tell them that? They're walking home. Benjamin's, you know, dragging along his silver carrying his clothes. So who's going to tell dad? Judah? I'm not going to tell him. My job's done, man. I'm... Simeon, this is your fault anyway. I'm, I'm... Reuben? No, don't let Reuben do it. He'll just, don't let Reuben do it. Who's going to tell him? Who wants to tell him? Dad, you know that thing about Joseph being devoured by beast? We, we actually sold him. But, but, that, but we found him again. It's okay. It's all, who wants to tell him, right? I mean, you know, make sure you guys don't argue in the way. Just, just, just go find him. Will you hurry up? So they went up out of Egypt. This had to be an interesting trip. And they came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. Do you think Jacob's been waiting for them? Oh, yeah. Probably looking at the horizon, just waiting and hoping that they would come back. And then here comes the cloud of dust. And with the wagons, that's going to add to this entourage. Here comes, you know, you can see the dust. And then here comes up on the horizon. And he goes, oh. he goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, praise God. Eleven. Whew. They get closer. And he's just, praise God. And he's, what, what's behind them back there? And they get closer. And they're, Dad! Joseph's alive. Huh? <laughs> Joseph's alive. Huh? Joseph is alive. He's governor of Egypt. Look at the verse. They told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. He's governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted. Ha! Huh? You know, the ladies remember, it's okay. It's like Sanford and Son. They're like, ah, oh, you know, they, it's okay. It's all right. And they're going, what did you say to him? Joseph's alive. Ah. You know, they're, what? His heart fainted, for he believed them not. That would be called too good to be true. And they told him all the words of Joseph. And you can see him going, huh, you sold him? You sold him? Benjamin's going, yeah, that's what they said. They sold him. You, know, you sold him? They told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, look at this. This was heavy. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. 
Oh, oh, oh. Wow, he did pretty good. That's my boy. That's why I favored him over you guys. Look, where's your wagon? You know. And Israel said, notice that name, Israel. God's working in his life. Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And so chapter 46, and Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba. Beersheba, there's a name, remember that name? Well of the seven, or the well of the oath. And that was where when Abraham, yeah, Abraham and Sarah went back through, came to Abimelech, and, and you know, she's my sister, and that went well. But eventually God dealt with the problem, and Abraham is allowed to leave, and he moves a little bit away and gets him some property there. And finally Abimelech and Phicol come to him and say, we can see God is with you. So make a covenant with us, make a treaty. And they were digging wells, and so Abraham said, okay, here are seven ewe lambs. What is all this about? It's an oath between you and me, and this will be um, Beersheba, well of the oath. And so Abraham there made this agreement with, a, with Abimelech and Phicol, and they took off. It would be in Beersheba that Isaac, as he's getting older, would say to his favored son Esau, son, go get some of that savory meat such as I love so that I may bless thee. And so Esau, yeah, yeah, I'm on it, dad. And he goes out, right? And here's Rebecca going, what? No, the younger is, the older is supposed to serve the younger. Jacob, come here, my son. Go get me two kids of the goats and, and put this on. But I'm not, just put this on. I'll take care of it. And he goes in. Is that you, my son Esau? <clears throat> yeah, dad, it's me. This is the same town where Jacob deceived his father and would be forced to flee from Esau and he wouldn't see his father for 20 years. I'm sure Jacob's struggling with, I can't believe they sold him. What knuckleheads? I can't believe they sold them, right? And then he comes to Beersheba, where he deceived his father because of his father's favoritism towards his brother, which would cost him 20 years of not being around his family. As he's on his way to see his son that his other sons deceived him about because of his favoritism towards Joseph, and he's not seen him now for 22 years. You ever hear of like sowing and reaping? So whatever anger he might have had as he came back to Beersheba, I'm sure things are beginning to work in his heart. Interesting too, Beersheba is where Abraham had offered sacrifice, where Isaac had offered sacrifice. And so now he's you know, looking to go to Egypt. Egypt was not a stellar moment in Abraham's history. Isaac, when he tried to go, God told him, no, no Egypt for you. So Jacob's got to be struggling going, well, he told me to come down, but God, what do you want? And here he comes to see Isaac's altar and Abraham's altar. And interestingly enough, we've not heard of Jacob having any sacrifice between him and the Lord since they were at Bethel. They left Shechem, got rid of the idols, but then Rachel died. And we haven't heard anything about sacrificing since then. There may be a whole lot going on in Jacob's life right now. But now he's being called Israel. He comes back to Beersheba. There he offered sacrifices under the God of his father, Isaac. Obviously wanting to make sure, am I supposed to go? And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and he said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here am I. When it was time to leave Laban, God told Jacob to go. When it was time to go back to Bethel from Shechem, God told Jacob to go. And so now God in his faithfulness once again is telling Jacob what he should do. Jacob said, here I am. And God said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt. What more do you need, right? And I will surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. You will not be separated from him again until you die. Now, Abraham was told much about this time in Genesis 15. I'll read it to you. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell on him. And God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Anybody want to guess where? 
Egypt, that's our next book, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And that nation also whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God's going to park Israel in Egypt. He's going to multiply them. He's going to bring them back to Canaan as a rod of judgment against the Canaanite nations. But he gives those nations 400 years to get it straightened out with them. And when they've refused to come back and return and repent, when they become so corrupt, then he brings Israel as his corrective rod. Fear not to go down into Egypt. For I will there make of thee a great nation, and I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little ones, and their wives, and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, and his sons and his sons' sons with him, and his daughters and his sons' daughters with all his seed brought he with them into Egypt. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben. Now if you're expecting, have at it. Here's a bunch of names for you. Just Hanak, Fali, or Falu. Hezron, Carmi, these are the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, and Zoar, or Zohar, and Shaul, son of a Canaanitish woman, which she appears to be the exception, not the rule for picking a wife. The sons of Levi, Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. We've been through that. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. Interesting. Look at verse 12. Zerah's sons are not mentioned, but it is Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Calco, and Dera from 1 Chronicles 2.5. Five. five of them. How many? Everybody, how many? Good, hang on to that. Sons of Zebulun, Sered, and Elon, and Jachlil. These be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob and Paddan Aram, with his daughter Dinah. And all the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. And the sons of Gad, Ziphion, Haggai, Shuni, and Esbon, and Uri, and Erodi, and Areli. And the sons of Asher were Jimnath, Ishua, Ishui, and Beria, Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Beria were Heber and Machiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah his daughter, and she, these bear, she, these she bear unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. Two sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin. And unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, which Esenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Bechir and Ashbel and Gera and Nema and Ehi and Rosh, Mupam and Hupam. <laughs> There's a story there for a reason. Boy, this guy has a lot of kids. Ard. And these are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All the souls were fourteen. The sons of Dan, Hushim. The sons of Naphtali were Jazil, or Jahazil, Guni, Jezer, uh, Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel his daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seventeen. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, note this please, besides Jacob's sons' wives were not counted. All the souls were three score and six. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten or seventy. You're going, oh, why do we care? Let me tell you why. Because in the Hebrew here, it has seventy. In the Greek translation of this Hebrew, it has seventy-five. Guys who have nothing better to do all day but work through the Bible as far as, you know, high critics or whatever, they say, you know, we're missing five. Wait a second. Is this a complete list? Are the daughters of law mentioned? Answer, no. It's not a complete list. It's not everybody who came in. It's a list of those descended from Jacob. But even in the case of Zerah, where there's five sons, they're not even mentioned, but they had to have come in with them because their brother came in with his sons. So it's not a complete list. But they're out, they diagram them out, they try to match them, no, oh, it's this, it's that, they try to explain. It's not a complete list. I've already wasted enough time on it. 
just so you know, it's not a complete list, in case you missed that. Anyway, verse 28. Jacob sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot, had it waxed probably, you know, polished, and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him. Interesting word, the verb form is often used of when an angel appears to man or when God appears and shows his glory. It's implying that Joseph shows up in his royal attire. He's second in command. Joseph presented himself unto him, unto Jacob. And he fell on his neck. And he wept on his neck, literally, continuously, uninterrupted, a good while. So he shows up, a magistrate, he gets a hold of his dad, and he starts weeping like a 17-year-old boy. Dad, I missed you. Son, you done good. Done real good. Can I ride that? <laughs> and verse 30, whom? Israel. You mean all this painful stuff going on? God is allowed to refine this man and make him what God wanted him to be? The answer is yes. And Israel said unto Joseph, now let me die since I have seen thy face, because you are yet alive. In other words, my life's complete. I've got what I need. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. Well, that sounds great. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Wait, let me get this straight. So you want us to meet Pharaoh and tell him we're abominable. Why would you do that? Well, the time they've been staying up in the land of Canaan, let's consider Judah. Has he been doing well living among the Canaanites, or has that been kind of dragging him down? Answer? Dragging him down. So God's got to get his people away from some of these bad influences because from this line of the Jews is going to come ultimately from the tribe of Judah, the family of David, King Messiah, the son of David, who will ride in on a donkey, open the eyes of the blind, raise the dead, cast out the demons, and he will present himself as King Messiah. Does that sound familiar at all? He's going to die between thieves. He's going to be buried with the rich. They're going to beat him with stripes. They're going to rip out his beard, but he's going to rise again the third day. That is King Messiah. And it must be according to prophecy so we will know that this is the book and he is the true and living God. So he's got to protect them. They need to be isolated for a while. Well, historians tell us that the Egyptians so despise shepherds that they will not intermarry with them. That'll help protect them, don't you think? They're not allowed in any of their religious sites or buildings because they're despicable and abominable. So that would keep them out of the worship of Egypt, which leaves them worshiping the true and living God. Basically, you couldn't pick a better place to take God's people and put them where they'll be provided for five years of famine, isolated from the surrounding people group, and allowed to stay the people that God has called for himself. You mean this whole, like, deliver my people, slavery, building pyramids, monuments, all this stuff, whatever they went through, God used that to keep them for his purposes? Answer? Yes. Wait a minute. You mean the painful trials, maybe the pain I'm in right now, or the things that have devastated my heart through my lifetime, God has allowed because he's preparing me for what he wants to do next? Answer? Good. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, many different people in this room going through trials, heartbreaks, some great joys, Some wondering, where are you? 
Why do you allow these things? And yet you are good, you're holy. Your ways are right, they're perfect. And Lord, personally, I thank you for that year of 1989 that brought me to my knees, brought me to eternal life, brought me to the end of myself and got me to see my own sin as you see it. When I realized the bondage I was in. And then suddenly, I met your son who loved me, who forgave me, willingly received me as his own if I would turn, open my heart, ask you to be my Lord. And personally, Lord, I can say you've been so faithful. You've never failed. And I can embrace those things that were so painful then because I see you use them now. If you're here and you're wondering, why is God allowing this? He will use everything in our lives. He doesn't waste a thing. God give us the grace to trust Him and to praise Him before we see the answer we were hoping for and to sense His love even in the times of darkness so we might praise Him in the times of light. Thank you, Lord. Be with your people and strengthen them this week, I pray, through your word as they fellowship with you at home. In Jesus' name, amen.